this out.
to hear you speak. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace you poured out on us. For your work done on the cross. That gives us life. There's nothing like that love that you pour out on us, Lord. speak to us. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. My Bible is open to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews as we continue our study together. Don't give up. I want to encourage you to get your Bible out and find your place there. We're going to be looking at one verse in particular, Hebrews 12.1, and then some verses in Hebrews chapter 11. I want to encourage you also to get something out to write on and to write with, And uh, because I'm going to ask you to write down a couple of things today. Um, One of the things that I just want you to be aware of while you're getting all that uh, out and ready to go, um, we have these available at the the connection desk out uh, across the wall there, Uh, just to help you with notes and uh, observations and a number of different things. And so these are out there every Sunday if you want to pick one up and take some notes. For me, it's helpful if I write some stuff down. Uh, I hope I hope it's helpful today. People ask me sometimes, what do you do while while connection groups are going on? Uh, between the two services, and I said, well, usually I rewrite my sermon because it's not worth preaching twice, and today, I told Luann before we came in, I, I feel like, um, and that's where I am today, and so my prayer is that, um, that God will speak clearly and uh, that God will speak powerfully through our time together today. Um, I, I don't know about you, but um, I, I grew up in a time when um, when a few did your best to do the right things and you didn't mess up too badly and you checked all the right boxes and you uh, prayed and you claimed the right verses of Scripture. Uh, you know, Romans eight twenty eight. all things work together for the good of those who love God and, you know, claim that verse and believe it. And, and, um, and, and it, we felt like if we kind of did those things then everything was, was going to be fine that everything was just going to kind of work out. But you know, in all of our trying, sometimes things just don't work out. Uh, We're not going to check all the boxes. Sometimes there are boxes there that we don't want to check because we never saw those things coming to our life. Sometimes, even though we try hard, we mess up, we fail. Even though we do our best to spend time praying, we still go through times of difficulty and you can claim verses from the Bible of all things work together for good those who love God. God will give you the desires of your heart. You can claim all those verses and try and live in all those promises. But sometimes you're going to go through those times described for us in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 13 when you're going to grow weak and you're going to grow weary. That's just the reality of life. And, and you, you think you, you are doing it all right and you've got it all together. God, why in the world would I have to go through the experiences that I'm dealing with because I'm trying hard here. I'm, I'm, I'm putting out effort here. I'm trying to connect. I'm trying to, to be up when times are difficult. But sometimes it is just difficult, and we go through those experiences of life that cause us to experience extreme grief and sorrow and stress and brokenness and heartache in our life. And we've talked about it over the past week, and we're going to continue to talk about this. And I want to take these verses of Scripture, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and really unpack them and pour that into our life because the reality is we need God to speak to us in times of brokenness in our life because all of us are going to go through times of brokenness in our life. There are two word pictures that the writer of Hebrews says to us, uh, gives to us in verse 1. And and, um, the first one we talked a little bit last week, he said that you are you are surrounded by this, this great cloud of, of witnesses. The word cloud, there are basically two times, it's two different ways it's used in the New Testament. One is what we would think to be 
our definition of a cloud of a specific shaped object in the sky that's floating along the sky, and so that's the image we have. The second one is actually the word that it's used here in Hebrews 12.1 for this cloud that surrounds us. It's more like what we would think of like a fog, that I'm completely surrounded by this. And, and the imagery, the picture that the writer of Hebrews wants you to grasp and wants you to get is this, that you are completely surrounded by this by this cloud of witnesses. They are surrounding you. They have enveloped you. They, they have totally, uh, almost like it's, uh, it's so dense that it's difficult for you to see beyond it, that kind of a fog. What I want you to understand today is that no matter how difficult the trial, adversity, or pain of your life, God has surrounded you if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has filled you with the power of his Holy Spirit and he has surrounded you by the witnesses who have gone before you to encourage you. We're surrounded by this cloud. And then he says to us that they're a great cloud of, and this, this word is key and it's a bit more problematic for us, the word witness. A witness has two primary components to it. First of all, it's someone who saw something. And when we look at these great people of the faith in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith or the hall of fame, whatever you choose to call it, when you look at them to understand that they, they see us, that they know what's going on. They, they see the struggles that you're feeling, that you're experiencing, and to know that this, the eye of these witnesses is on us is incredibly powerful for us. Now, for some, it's problematic because we, we just think, of, you know, is it possible for those people who are in heaven to be able to see what's going on in the earth? I want to read a couple of paragraphs, and bear with me. I, I should have memorized this, but I can barely remember my birthday. I can hide my own Easter eggs, and so... Um, some of you will figure that out on the way home. Hey, I get it. it was, that was pretty good. Kyle Eidemann says that when we think of a witness or someone who witnesses it, it's someone who sees something. Some scholars think that's the idea the Hebrew writer was going for, that we are surrounded by these heroes of the faith who are now watching us. They see us. They are in heaven looking down. They're watching us run this race. That seems to be the picture that's being painted in Hebrews 12. But here's the problem. I and many others have encountered, when I think about it that way, the Bible says that in heaven there's no sorrow, there's no mourning, there's no crying, there's no pain. How can someone be in heaven and endure seeing the hardships of earth and God's people? It would certainly be sad, I would think, that they would feel our sorrow, they would see our shame. Theologians explain it by saying that the joy, listen to this, that the joy of heaven is not based on ignorance. Meaning that you're joyful in heaven not because you're ignorant of what happened on earth or what is currently happening on earth, but the joy of heaven is based on an, on an eternal perspective. Suddenly you can see things differently than you could here on earth. You see, they are watching us from a, an and an eternal perspective because they understand that one day that those of you who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are going to be in that place where they are according to Revelation chapter 21 is a place where there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, there's no more suffering, there's no more death, a place where all of the former things have passed away. And when you keep the eternal perspective that one day we will live in that place of perfection and purity and praise, it enables us to deal with the adversity and the difficulties of walking through the trials of this earth. They have us surrounded. They, they see us. But I think also, and this, this, this just creeps some people out, is they're speaking to us. I've never actually had anyone literally speak to me from the dead. I've never heard the audible voice of God. You know, people say all the time, well, God told me this and God told me that. And I was a little bit suspicious of that because I think if God spoke to me audibly, I mean, I just, I, I would, 
the, the rapture would occur, I'd be, I'd be gone. I just would, that would freak me out for God to actually speak to me. There's an interesting verse of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, that is, is powerful to me. That He says, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Abel still speaks even though he is dead. You see, I think this great cloud of witnesses have us surrounded. You can't go anywhere as a believer in Jesus Christ without them. They have completely surrounded you with their presence. They see you. They know what you're dealing with and what you're struggling with from not out of ignorance but in eternal perspective and cheering you on as they see you deal with the adversities and the challenges of life but they also are speaking to us. I want you to write down this question on your paper you have out um, because I'm going to try and get to five people from this whole 11th chapter of Hebrews and that it would take forever to go through all of them And, and I know you don't have the patience for that, but I want you to write this question down because the statements that I'm going to make about five different individuals need to be run through the filter of this question. What are the witnesses saying to you specifically about your journey of faith? What are they saying specifically, and we'll leave it up there for a couple of minutes to give you time to write it down. What are they saying specifically to you about your journey of faith? You see, I think they desire to speak into our lives. When you think of the word encouragement, you think about, uh, man, that that, that word spoken to make me feel better about a tough situation or circumstance. This word literally, the word encourage, literally interpreted means to fill with courage or strength. That's what they're speaking into your life, courage and strength. Remember what we talked about last Sunday, we don't need sympathy, we need strength. We don't need to be consoled or comforted. We need to be courageous as we deal with the difficult circumstances of life. And they're speaking those words of encouragement into us. So what are the witnesses saying to you specifically? One of the things that I would challenge you to do is to take time to read through Hebrews 11 and then refer back to where these people are spoken of in the Old Testament and to allow them to speak to you. I, I, I have picked out five today, not that they're more unique or better or anything else, but five of these people, I think, as they speak to me, and I think uh, when I ask the question, what are the witnesses saying to me specifically about my journey of faith, these five are speaking specific things into my life, and the first is Abel. He says to us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks to us through his faith. Even though he is dead, he still speaks to us about this sacrifice of our life. Now we understand If we've read the Old Testament, he tells us again here in verse 4 that Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. I think Abel would say to me, if he spoke to me from the dead, make sure, make certain that your life is an acceptable offering to the Lord. Make sure that it's an acceptable sacrifice, an acceptable offering to the Lord. In fact, Paul would tell us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Therefore I tell you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to, to give yourself as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And one of the challenges of the Old Testament was that people would bring sacrifices to the Lord that were not an acceptable sacrifice. And I think in, even on this side of the cross, we deal so often with the same kind of challenges. Because our 20th century term that defines relationship to Jesus Christ is commitment. I'm committed to the Lord. I'm committed to the church. I'm committed to this and that. We make all kinds of commitments. You see, here are two struggles I have with commitment. One is you can make a commitment, but you can also take it back. I used to be committed to that, but I'm not committed to that anymore. The other thing that troubles me with this word commitment is that there are different levels of commitment. 
and I'm, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm committed, but I'm really not all in. Or yeah, man, this this is something. This is something that I'm really, really committed to. You see, the scripture doesn't dwell on this word commitment. The, the word the scripture uses for our life that determines a a a. a A sacrifice that is honorable to the Lord is the word surrender. That it's I'm completely, altogether, absolutely in. That's the sacrifice that God is looking for from your life. That you're totally, absolutely living a life that is surrendered to Him. The second person I want to mention to you is in verse 7 of Hebrews 11. By faith Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world, became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You understand this um, this ark, and if, if, you've, if you've not read the story in detail, I would encourage you to go back to Genesis 6 and reread the story because this, building this ark wasn't a weekend project. It wasn't something that God said to Noah, hey, if you'll take a few weekends, kind of give yourself to this, and you can have holidays off, that kind of thing, and maybe just work on the evening when you have a little bit of time, uh, you, you get this ark built because it's going to rain and destroy the world. And the Scripture says to us that it took him 120 years to build the ark. Aside from preaching a little bit on the side, this was his primary responsibility. He spent 120 years working on this boat. And I, I'm, I'm confident there were some issues with his family. I'm confident at some point Miss Noah said, are you going to do anything besides work on that boat? I've got a to-do list that I need you to get to. You're not doing that. you got three sons who would love to have some of your time. I think two out of the three they probably thought that of because I'm just telling you there's something messed up about a Jewish family that would name one of their sons Ham. And so maybe it's like Ham's messed up, you know. But two of your three sons, they, they could use a little bit of your time. But the scripture says, and he repeats it twice for us in Genesis. First of all, in Genesis uh, chapter 6 and verse 22, and then in chapter 7 and verse 5, that Noah did everything the Lord commanded him. He did everything the Lord commanded him. Why did he do that? He, did, he tells us in Hebrews eleven seven 7, because he was motivated by godly fear. The motivation of godly fear caused him to do everything the Lord commanded him to do. You know what? I think one of the greatest reasons we're not doing everything the Lord commands us to do is because we have lost a godly fear or a respect for God. So we'll just do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it, with no regard for God, with total disregard. We, we may ask him, but then we just do what we wanted to do anyway. And there was this godly fear that motivated him. He said, I will do everything. Listen, if obedience is not, if it's not complete, it's not obedience. And say he did almost everything. He said he did everything God told him to do. Everything. If obedience is not complete, it's not obedience. If obedience is delayed in our life, it's delay, it, it's not obedience. Noah had never seen it rain before, and I'm sure not only his family, but the ridicule of his neighbors and people around him. Man, what are you, you going to do with this big ark? They'd never seen it rain before. They'd never seen a drop of rain before their entire lives. And Noah's, man, he's preaching, telling people God's going to send a flood. God's going to send a flood. 120 years later, it started sprinkling, and then people realized maybe Noah had more on the ball than we thought he had. We thought he had absolutely lost his mind building this boat. You see, there are going to be times in your life when people will question you, when people will ridicule you, when you will get tired, when you will grow weary. And I think Noah would say to us, when you get tired, when you get discouraged, when you want to quit, keep on going. Don't slow down. Don't stop. Keep pressing forward. Let's move to verse 8. We talked about Abraham a little last week. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive his inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. I think Abraham would say to us, 
listen to God, follow, follow the direction of God. Sometimes I feel like, uh, man, I, I feel like I had to have a clear discernment in my spirit of how how God's leading and how God's working, and I'm, I'm following God down that path, and I think, uh, man, this, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm following the Lord and, and His will, and then we come to a difficult circumstance, and we, we, we hit a curve. We hit some bumps in the road. It's like driving through the parking lot, and some, some of these people, they don't have speed bumps. They have speed mountains, you know. It's just like I get going. All of a sudden, I, I, I hit something, and I realize, you know what, maybe I, maybe I missed it somewhere. You know, God doesn't wake up in the morning to check your calendar to see what he needs to do in your life. He has his own calendar and his own agenda for your life. And it needs to be the goal of your life to discover, God, what is it that you want to do with my life? Because I can promise you this, as difficult as it may seem for you to be, uh, to, to understand the season you're going through right now, that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect, that God's timing is always perfect. He never shows up like God is absolutely sovereign and he is in control of your life. And you need to discover what God's sovereign will is for you. And we don't, we don't need to have these, you know, kind of ethereal thoughts that somewhere the mystery of God is out there and we talked about the word for cloud and you know, God, if I, if I see the Virgin Mary's profile in a cloud, then I'll know this is your will. It's not some mystical thing like that. I think God speaks to us primarily through his word. And if you want to know what God's will for your life is, you need to get into the word of God. Say, God, I need your direction. God doesn't need to speak to us in a different way or another way than he already has in his word. God has spoken to us in his word. He's revealed his will for us, but we lose, we oftentimes lose our, our sense of, of direction. Move to verse 22. And I know I'm skipping over some folks, and, but, but I want to come to this verse of scripture, verse 22. There isn't much said or written about Joseph in the context of our verses he just simply says to us, verse 22, By faith Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. That's all it says. So Joseph was a good planner, pre-planning his funeral. Here's what I want you to do with the bones after I'm, I'm gone. The only other thing it says about him that, yeah, he mentioned the, uh, the exodus of the children of Israelites. He, he does mention that and then, tells us what to do with his bones. You know, Joseph, um, Joseph, man, was a dreamer. Um, primarily, God spoke in the Old Testament through dreams and visions and prophecy. That freaks some of us out a little bit, but there are only, only two people in all of the Bible. There are a lot of people who had dreams, the only two in people the scripture says that I actually could interpret dreams. One was Joseph and one was Daniel. So when you think about the context of Joseph and dreaming, understand that he was a guy who dreamed big. Through this dream and through this vision, he felt like there, God had an incredible plan for his life. He thought he knew what his life was going to be like. And then his brothers sell him into slavery. He ends up in prison for a crime he didn't commit. But he didn't sit and pout and feel sorry for himself. He didn't get angry with God because his dreams were unfulfilled. In the midst of that and through whatever season or difficulty he went through, he never questioned or doubted God. He never, ever gave up. Joseph says to me, don't lose perspective. Let's go to one more. Let's think about, um, let's think about um, Rahab. And if you go all the way down to verse 31, it says, By faith Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. 
Joshua chapter 2 is a powerful story of the grace of God. And I think Rahab would say to us, you know what, God can use you no matter what your past is like. No matter what your past is like, God can use you. That, my friend, is a powerful, powerful truth from the Word of God. The enemy will tell you that you've done too much, you've been too bad, your sins are too, are too gross, you've been, you've been in sin too long, there, there's no way, there's no way that God would forgive you. Not only will the enemy tell you that, but others will press into your life with the same truth. You know what? How can God use you because of all the things that you've done, because of your past, because of your path? Why in the world would God use you? God couldn't use you. When I was in high school, I remember this phenomenon, if you will, that began to happen in, in our churches and, and I, through my high school years and then college years and I went to be youth pastor to church when I was a freshman, November of my freshman year in college. So I remember that, you know, sitting with my students, thinking, what in the world is this guy or this lady talking about? Because we, we went through this time when we would bring these people in to share testimonies in our church. And, I mean, these, these people were like, um, they, they would make Rahab look like a, a saint. It was just... Um, I mean, they would say, well, I, man, you know, these ladies, I was in prostitution and, and addicted to heroin and all this stuff. And these guys, you know, would talk about all the things they used to do. They used to own a nightclub and, and um, they would dance in the 70s. You know, you, you couldn't use the D word in church, but they did. And, and uh, they would dance and do all this stuff. And I remember we had this one guy, they, he, he was, he, his past was so sorted and so bad that he was involved like in organized crime. And um, he said, you know, I, there, there's still a bounty for me now There's, there's for my head. I'm like, you know, I don't really know you, but um, it, it, it's okay if there is. I just, don't, I just don't want them to come get you right now while we're all sitting in this room together. But I remember sitting there thinking, you know what? I, I need to go out and do some stuff to spice up my testimony. thinking, I need to go commit some good sin, you know, and get this thing better, then maybe I can hit the circuit. But, but you know, I sit there and, and I thought about that. And as a nine-year-old boy, I gave my heart to Christ. I, I, I wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there were times I lied to my mom and dad. I hated my brother to the core. Um, the worst thing I'd ever, I can remember doing was I went to the Ben Franklin at Jinx and stole some of those red wax lips one Halloween. But beyond that, I mean, it wasn't like I was on death row or anything, okay? And I thought, man, I just, I, I, what have I got? Let me tell you what I have and what I had, what you have if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a God who's forgiven you of your past, of your sin. You don't need to spice up anything, man. You have a God who loves you enough that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sin. And his word tells us that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us from all of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He tells us that he takes our sin and he buries them in the deepest part of the sea. Did you know you can't see the deepest part of the sea? He tells us that he will take our sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. I wonder why God chose east from west and not north from south. If you think about it, if you start traveling around planet earth and let's say you're going east and you just continue to go east, you're never going west, you're always going east, it would always come back, it would come back, it would come back. If he just said from north to south, you start south, eventually you're going north and it's coming back. Listen, he said, he didn't say I cast your sin as far as the north and the south because that means it's coming back. He said, I'm casting your sin as far as the east is from the west and you can bring that sin up to me and I'll say, you know what, I've forgotten all about that, I don't even remember that. Listen, Stop reminding God of your sin and accept his forgiveness. 
confess it, repent of it, and accept the forgiveness of God. And Rahab says, listen, I don't care what you've done. I'm a prostitute. I don't care what you've done. God will forgive you. A whole list of people that we didn't get to, 12 that are mentioned by name, the prophets we talked about last week and the others we never even, we didn't get to today. But here's my challenge for you this afternoon, this week, to sit down and go through Hebrews chapter 11 and discover what that person's experience was and then to run that through the filter, the lens of the question that we ask, what is that person saying specifically to me about my journey of faith. Those are five that God spoke to me specifically about my journey of faith. For every one of them, there are two words that precede their story and I think really tell or really define their story and it's these two words, by faith, by faith. One of the things that we're trying to do and we need your help with is to get the word out to people in our community and the world about the series of Don't Give Up because the reality is, folks, a lot of people are ready to give up. And they're so desperate, they've so given up that they're trying everything else to try and bring that fulfillment back to their lives. We've posted these things on social media. I say we. I haven't had anything to do with it except tell Whitley to do it because I don't, I don't know how to do it. But one of the, the posts that we sent out on Facebook, and it's been other social media, Facebook and Instagram and, and, and um, Twitter, and I don't even know what else there is. That's how stupid I am. But I think it was on Tuesday of this past week we sent this out. Faith keeps believing in even when the pieces don't seem to fit together. Faith keeps believing even when the pieces don't seem to fit together. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've I've tried for the most part to check all the boxes. I've tried to be good, not to do too much bad stuff or too many bad things. Praying, studying my Bible, memorizing verses, claiming verses of Scripture. But sometimes it's still still just puzzling because it didn't end up like we thought it was going to. The journey looks different than we thought it was going to look. Some of the pain and some of the adversity and some of the change and trials that we're going through, we didn't see coming. We think, why? why, why? Because I've I've tried to check all the boxes. I've tried to do all these things. But still, it seems like there is so much Adversity and difficult and pain in my life. It is extremely, extremely puzzling to me. But faith keeps believing even when the pieces don't seem to fit together. And you look at that one missing piece of your life, that one missing part of the puzzle. And you take something that doesn't fit, you try and make it fit. And I don't care how hard you try or how hard you pound on it. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And You need to allow a sovereign God who knows what the picture looks like when it's done because he's sovereign. He sits high and looks low. You need to allow God in his sovereign hand to push that right piece and place it in you'll have the faith to believe and not give up. Maybe for you, the missing piece is that your life is not an acceptable offering to the Lord. Maybe for you, the missing piece is that you are tired, you're discouraged, and you're ready to quit. Maybe the missing piece for you is that you have not listened to God and you have followed the direction that you desire to go with your life. You have lost respect or fear of God. Maybe 
you've lost perspective. And your perspective is your trials and your difficulties and it's not keeping your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. It may be you're trapped in your past and you think God can't love you and God can't forgive you. Whatever the missing piece is in your life, today I'm going to challenge you to allow God to take that peace, to take that life, to finish the picture of your life and to push that missing piece into place today. Father, I thank you that there is a cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, that encompasses us completely. Father, a cloud, a fog that is so dense that we can't even see, we can't even see beyond it in this cloud of witnesses. Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit infills us, that your witnesses surround us. Father, I'm thankful that they that they see us. They know the pain, they know the trial, they know the adversity, but they see it through the lens of eternity. Father, I thank you that they, they speak to us. And God, I pray that you speak to us today through them, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Our life is filled with ups and downs. And God, some of us are at the top of the mountain right now, but we'll be at the valley We'll be there eventually. And Father, I pray that, God, that you would surround us and see us and speak to us and speak courage into our life today, speak strength into our life today. Father, I pray for hurting hearts and lives in this room today. God, that we would trust that by faith, that we would have faith that we have a sovereign God. Father, may we trust the pieces of our life to you to know that you'll put them together, that there'll be a beautiful picture of our life. God, allow us to surrender ourselves to you today, to give you control of our life today. God, would you push the pieces where they need to be? And I pray these things in Jesus' name.